Excellent. Thanks, uh, thanks, IOSG and Vishal. Would you just come in? Ah, I come in. Eh? <laughs> for giving me this opportunity. So I'll be giving a comprehensive overview for the comprehensive ophthalmologist. So viral, uh, 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 when you are dealing with the case, first you have to understand that you need to recognize the clinical signs. And it can come with various clinical signs, like it can present with retinitis and all. But being an ophthalmologist, you must not miss the retinitis. For those who are not very familiar, and uh, I'll uh, just give them a tips that how to differentiate between choroiditis and retinitis. You in, in retinitis, you will see that the retinal vessels are obscured, whereas in with choroiditis, you will see the vessels normally, so clearly. So now you have to remember one thing that the retinitis is almost always infectious. Whatever the cause of uh, infectious retinitis, you think it is always infectious, except for two conditions where it looks like retinitis, but it is not retinitis. So number one is basic disease, where you see the retinal infiltrates, and which is associated with retinal vasculitis. And sometimes if you do a fundus fluid angiography, you will see the fine like leakage. And uh, you need to uh, uh, diagnose them properly, and the th you know the treatment is paradoxic. The second is sometimes you see that sub RP cream uh, 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 deposits like this. And this is, these are the cases of intraocular lymphoma. Sometimes you may miss them as retinitis. So the, you have to do a systemic imaging. Sometimes you need to do a vitreous biopsy. And I think uh, Professor uh, Gupta already explained that how, how you should not actually tackle. If you don't know, you should not treat these cases. Better to review, uh, send this patient to a UVS specialist or oncologist. Now, uh, those who are uh, familiar uh, uh, with only, I know many of, of the ophthalmologists in India, they do the direct ophthalmoscopy. So one thing you have to realize, if you are not doing indirect ophthalmoscopy, sometimes you can miss, sometimes you can treat a viral posterior uveitis only as an anterior uveitis and can miss a dreaded conditions like this patient. So if you see here, if you don't examine the periphery, you can miss the acute retinal necrosis, which is mostly caused by the herpes virus, uh, herpes simplex 1, 2, and varicella zoster. So usually a triad of uh, inflammation you see in these cases. Now what are the triad? The first one is that retinitis, and it starts in periphery, a pattern that may correspond to the termini of the ganglion cells of the nerve fiber through which the virus propagates. Now the second one you see, so, uh, the retinitis characteristically it shows that the, it's a peripheral as I told and they have a confluent retinitis, the edges are scalloped and you can see the discrete margins. Now the second uh, is the arteritis, you can see the occlusive vasculitis, uh, uh, mainly the arteries are involved. And as, as you can understand, there is a lot of retinitis and the inflammatory process is going on and all the debris will be poured over the, uh, in, into the vitreous. So you, you see a lot of vitreitis uh, in these patients. Now, you have to understand that this is a dreaded condition. So you, it's rapidly involved the periphery entire, entire, uh, entire retina. And if you are not treating them, the fellow eye involvement is very common in streaks of initial symptoms. So you have to be very careful. So it is said that the acyclovir treatment actually reduces the other eye involvement from 64 to 24%. Now, what happens here when the retinal necrosis continues, then there will be a progressive retinal thinning and atrophy. And as a result of there may be a development of break and also you have to understand because there is a lot of cellular infiltration is happening into the vitreous. So there will be a vitreous membrane and so this kind of patients will develop RD very, very frequently and this will have a, both the component, both the tractional and the regmatogenous component. So you have to be very careful when you are handling a patient of acute retinal necrosis, you have to tell them in, in details that these are the patients are prone to develop the retinal detachment and other complications. Another posterior pole uh, viral retinitis is that progressive outer retinal necrosis. I'm not going to tell you the abbreviated name. So uh, the, it, it is characterized by the absence of retinal vasculitis. There will be minimal or very less inflammation in the vitreous and it progresses entirely, but it starts reverse way of ARN. It starts from the posterior pole and involves the periphery. Now, when you are dealing with the posterior UV, viral uveitis, you have to identify the vasocentric lesions. That if the lesions are vasocentric, then you have to suspect that it can be cytomegalovirus retinitis, which can be bilateral in 30 per, 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 uh, patients. And these are notoriously white eye uveitis. Some, sometimes there will be no congestions and mini or minimal vitreitis. 
and it can affect all the areas. It can affect the posterior pole, periphery, or both simultaneously. Now, if you see the broad uh, differentiation between the HSV visit uh, infection and the CMV, the pr first one inf involves the immunocompetent patient, and CMV is most commonly seen in immunocompromised, though we can see the involvement in immunocompetent patient as well. But you have to understand that the HSV and VZB enters the eye through the neurons, whereas the CMV, the primary mode is hematogenous. Now the second one is very important. The HSV and VZB replicate very fast and it will finish off the retina within a period of time if you are not starting antiviral. Whereas compared to that, the CMV, they replicate very slowly. It is say, it, it has been seen that every 18 hours is their replication period. So it has this relatively slower progressions. Now, there are broadly three varieties you can be seen, and most of us, we are familiar with pizza pie retinopathy. So you know that how to diagnose the fulminant. Let me tell uh, you about the indolent variety. Indolent variety is granular, often can be seen in periphery, and you miss that pizza pie-like appearance that you may not see hemorrhage in these cases, so don't miss them. Uh, think that, that always remember that the granular variety of CMB is little different than the conventional variety. Now, prostate branch angiitis can be seen in various other conditions. One of them is CMV, and it requires little investigations and uh, imaging. So now, when you are uh, dealing with the immunosuppression, you have to, uh, when you are dealing with the CMV retinitis, you have to pay attention to the history of immunosuppression. Now, this immunosuppression can be disease or therapeutic. You have to rule out HIV in all patients. And one more important thing you have to realize in this era of anti-VHF and uh, uh, diabetic retinal with enrichment that local immunosuppression. So if you are not getting any proper history, always ask the patient whether there is any previous history of any intravitreal steroid injections or not. So this is immunosuppression is very important. I will show you a case of 22-year-old uh, female who presented with a history of dengue fever. And the, uh, she developed a biopsy, uh, skin lesions. You can see the biopsy revealed pyoderma gangrenosum, which was treated with cyclo cyclosporine. And you can see the based on the photograph and all, we realized that it's a case of CMB retinitis. We treated the patient with intravitreal gancyclovir and the, the retinitis resolved completely. HIV was negative in a 22-year-old female. I was desperate to find out that why it happened. So I sent the patient to an infectious disease specialist. Now the infectious disease specialist uh, 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 called me and told me that, see, I can't find anything, so let's do a PET scan. So I, I just ordered a PET scan and sent the patient back. And later we realized that the PET scan showed hypermetabolic enlarged supradiabetic uh, lymph nodes and CT guided biopsy, biopsy found that the, it was a case of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So sometimes this CMV retinitis can be a present, uh, presentation of this kind of manifestation also, so which you uh, keep in mind. Now, this is very important in our country that do not rely on serology as a laboratory diagnosis for the herpes viruses. Stott's titer is not going to solve your problem. Many time I see that some retinitis, some anterior reviators also people will rely entirely on the Stott's titer and try to uh, uh, treat them. Look at these two studies that 92% of the human shed HSV1 DNA in their beard. The other study showed that the 93% of the human autopsy revealed that there was a HSV1 DNA in their trigeminal ganglia non-autopsy. So you have to understand that the polymerase chain reaction remains the main st stay of diagnosis and that only two serological tests you do in cases of herpetic uveitis is that you rule out syphilis and HIV. So coming to the treatment of the herpetic viral retinitis, that primary aim, as, we, as I discussed, the arrest the progression of the retinitis and prevents the other involvement. So it is important to differentiate HSV, VZB, and CMV. So you need to do a PCR because CMV lacks the thymidine kinase. So if you are treating a CMV with antiviral like acyclovir, it's not going to respond. So this is the basic thing you have to understand. The second thing is that the valacyclovir has higher viability. So is the valgancyclovir, which has higher, uh, uh, higher viability than the gancyclovir. So these are the treatments. And ideally, the, it is the combination of the systemic and intravitreal antiviral, which is preferred. So you need to uh, add the gancyclovir. And sometimes if it is not responding, then you can actually go ahead with the foscarnitin. Now, do remember these three basic points when you are treating a case of herpetic retinitis. The number one, all these drugs are virustatic and not virucidal. That means the reactivation of the herpes infection will, uh, will start again if you stop the antiviral. 
the second one these antivirals has limited effect on the latent hyperarthric virus so the moment you stop the antiviral there can be a reactivation of antiviral so this is a very important point you should take home the second is it is not the antiviral don't treat posterior uh, herpetic uveitis only with intravitreal because intravitreal therapy alone can have a higher risk of the other eye involvement so you have to give the systemic antiviral to prevent the other eye involvement now coming to one point here that optic nerve involvement sometimes can ha have a, 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 can be seen in this viruses so that's why the corticosteroid in systemic doses sometimes may help but be, uh, please be sure that you are not injecting any intravitreal steroid in this patient it will be disaster so don't inject any intravitreal steroid in this case now there is another important point that history of fever we see and there is a viral retinitis so overall you see there is a umbrella signs like posterior viral retinitis following fever i will just try to highlight this three uh, entities one is the dengue the dengue will have a multifocal retinitis the hemorrhagic retinopathy can be seen and they have a, uh, they are usually they can have a macular involvement the next one is the chikungunya it is multifocal and phenotypically it is it mimics herpetic retinitis sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate from herpetic retinitis the third is west nile i i, I thank uh, mr kairala for this uh, for this photograph so west nile virus we, this is these are also multifocal but you can see this linear pattern of the retinitis which actually related to the course of the retinal nerve fibers now most important is this herpes after fever there can be reactivation of the herpes viruses as well now if you see that what are the single most factor that can cause the reactivation of the herpes viruses in the ganglion is that rise in the cyclic amp level now this cyclic amp level can be raised even after fever even after emotional stress this cyclic amp can go high so reactivation of the herpetic viruses can occur even after that also and after fever also look at this uh, this picture this picture often looks like a chikungunya retinitis or some other retinitis the patients had a history of fever and finally uh, the pcr showed it was a case of bzb and we treated with oral steroid and acyclovir and it uh, dramatically responded now when we talk about fever and retinitis this is a girl referred from bangladesh had a post uh, diagnosis of post viral retinitis with rash myalgia and uh, you can see the joint pain and uh, this uh, this girl the presented picture like this you can see here there was an area of retinal whitening you can see that marked venous tortuosity and hyperemic disc so only positive was the girl informed us about a uh, history of photosensitivity and the subsequent investigation showed that it is a, uh, she was positive for a ana and subsequently we found that it was a case of sim, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus so basically we were dealing with a case of pushner plaquen secondary to sle and sometimes the sle patient they can develop fever they can have develop myalgia so sometimes it can be mistaken as a viral uh, uveitis i'll just take one minute more so the, sometimes you have to understand that atypical lesions like peripheral lesions are all peripheral lesions are not arn it can be snow banking it can be serpiginous choroiditis and sometimes can be ocular toxoplasmosis also so toxoplasmosis is a major differential di diagnosis because it can have a like virus it can have a high iop it can have a anterior chamber inflammation and significant reaction of the vitreous oct is a valuable marker as is a paper by alexandro and uh, anirudh and they showed that that you can see this hyper reflective oval deposits in the inner surface, surface of the retinal so you do a oct in sus uh, suspicious cases which will help you i'll just conclude with this that not all viral retinitis can be treated with injectable injectable gancyclovir like this 29 year old male presented with sudden diminution of vision and history of fever and over a whatsapp chat we i just saw the photo and i just uh, asked the ophthalmologist that let's let's send the patient here so when the patient came here the young male and the, i i sent the patient to neurologist and i was asking that that can you do a uh, csf tap the neurologist was telling eeg is normal there is no cns finding why you want me to do that so finally that anti measles antibody from the csf was both high in serum and csf so this was a case of basically a measles retinopathy so sometimes this this as you know that this this kind of disease is near fatal disease it presents with focal necrotizing retinitis and even if you in, uh, treat them with interferon it is not going to prevent the death so it is a fatal conditions and you must actually diagnose them early
So I'll just conclude with that uh, for ruling out the posterior viral leviitis, rule out the mimickers of the retinitis, examine and identify the clinical phenotype of the viral retinitis. Torch titer has a limited role, PCR has a better sensitivity. Immunosuppression systemic or therapeutic need to be ruled out in cases with CMV retinitis. Optic nerve involvement is important cause of visual loss in viral uh, uveitis, pay attention to that. Intravitreal and systemic antiviral is the mainstay of treatment in herpetic posterior uveitis. And testing HIV and syphilis is a must in all cases of posterior uveitis. Intravitreal steroids should not be used in viral posterior uveitis. 